We have Meryl Tangasol joining me here on the show here today. First African-American woman to fly the U-2 spy plane, Dragon Lady, as you all know. It's an honor to have you here today. Welcome to the show. How's everything going? Uh, thank you so much for having me, man, Max. Uh, everything's going good. You know, summertime. Yeah, you got to enjoy it while it's here. You're out in Sacramento. Yeah, I'm out in the Sacramento area. So, uh, yeah, you, you're you're back in my, you know, where I was born and raised. So, yeah, cool. <laughs> back in. I actually live in Connecticut, went to school out in Queens at St. John's. So the only thing I don't like about this area is the the weather. Once it starts getting cold, you feel it. Yeah, I went to University of New Haven, so I, I feel you on that. That's right. I engineering degree. So what, what what took you to the University of New Haven? You know, it was the school that um, had, it was a private school, number one. Um, it had a really good engineering program. The ratio of teachers to students was small. And um, I'll be honest with you, it had probably one of the better party lives of all the colleges I was checking out. <laughs> So I wanted I wanted the full experience in terms of my college life, you know, leaving high school. So I wanted I wanted to do everything. They had a basketball team, they had a division two basketball team, softball team, they had ROTC. So for me, and it was very diverse. So I was I was big into that at that time. So it had everything that I wanted. No, that's important. And, and I'm happy to hear that you achieved your degree in engineering, but we'll, we'll get into your history. You're from the Bronx originally. I heard about your family life and you telling your mom at a young age that you wanted to be an astronaut at the age of seven. And she's like, oh, that's nice. And I and I heard about your father wasn't really present, but was she someone that instilled in you to have a strict mindset and to be disciplined because you were someone that were basically a go-getter at, at the youngest age, right then at the bull age of seven, you knew you didn't want to do a nine to five, but you always knew you wanted to be an astronaut. So who kind of instilled that strict mindset for you? You know, my mom, you know, she had to go to work back to work because she had to support us. So I think for her, you know, she, she made it happen. She went from working as a bank teller and she quit that and worked for the government as a postal in the postal service. So when she did that, she started at, you know, working nights and I had to stay with my grandmother a lot. And, but that was something that she had to do. And I think as a kid, you, you see the people around you and you become a product of those people around you. So my grandmother worked hard, you know, she was an older lady, but she worked at a, uh, a senior citizens kind of, I don't want to say after school, but a day center type thing where there was a lot of activities and food and she served and my mom worked hard. So I got, you know, I watched that and I said, that was just, what they did so i knew i was going to do something like that so i i like to work hard but i also like to have fun hence you you and h <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds like you had a great time there and i'm happy because th that's what's so important about go to going to college i really didn't get to experience that at st john's because i was so disciplined in my studies and doing so much with my journalism career. I didn't, the party time never came. So <laughs> I look at my parties when I talk to people and not the, the other shenanigans that go on. But <laughs> I, I want to get into this because you were watching all this stuff, Star Trek, the Twilight Zone, all the science fiction really inspired oh. you as well to wanting to get into the astronaut aspects. Yeah, um, absolutely. Star Trek was probably the biggest influence because it was about you know, Gene Roddenberry, who was the creator of that, had a great vision in terms of having these people from diverse backgrounds, whether you were aliens, whether you were black, white or whatever on this world. And they went out to explore strange new worlds and seek out new civilizations. And they came with all these great skill sets to kind of figure out problems and overcome these problems. And everyone had their role and everyone equally, they contributed differently at different times, but everyone was important. So I think that was something that I was into like hey I love to work with a team of people exploring something doing something dangerous I mean it's a there's a for me personally there's some excitement into the unknown the challenges how far can you push yourself as a human being how far can you go uh physically mentally emotionally yeah I'm, I'm all about that if it's if it's something that pushes you and you learn something at the end of that I'm not afraid of that at all no some people are yeah and you're one of the brave and, and courageous out there, no doubt about it. You you eventually get into the Navy because this was your way in. This is how you looked at it. Right. So as you get older, you know, reality sets in and, and the, you know, the reality landscape sit, sets in. So there's two ways, you know, to become an astronaut, you have to be a pilot. 
or you have to be someone with a PhD um, in the sciences. And, you know, the sciences for me is something I'm into also. And I explored that going through high school, but I really wanted to fly. And so there's two ways to go commercial route. So you could be flying for Delta Airlines or whatever airline company, which they need a lot of pilots, by the way, um, all the airlines and, or the military. But to go pri commercially, you have to pay a lot of money out of pocket. The military, you pay, but you pay in time of service. And for me, it was about I looked at the military, okay, this is an avenue for me to help get me to my goal, but it's also, I'm that type of person that if I did not become a pilot, I still would have served in the military regardless for at least four years. Um, I think that's something that we should all do, um, whether you agree with me or not. I think it gives you some type of uh, service, government service or civil service, whether you're working in the state level, uh, the federal level, or you're working at the Peace Corps. I think. There's something in it about giving to people or sacrificing time or energy to do certain things. Uh, I think there's goodness in that. So, um, yeah, the military it was. So uh, it worked out where I started in the Navy. Most astronauts at that time were naval aviators. And I got picked up for the Navy and into the pilot program, granted, uh, contingent upon me finishing officer candidate school. So wow. it all started. Did, did you ever have the chance of meeting these historical figures? Because you're a historical figure yourself in, in making history. But did you ever have the chance to meet someone like a Buzz Aldrin? I have not. Not yet. No. I'm sure it's in the cards. I'm yeah. sure. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to meet Mae Jameson. Our paths, I'm surprised, have not crossed yet. But, yeah, eventually it will. Um, yeah, eventually it will. And one of the presidents, they got to call you here because Biden's in office now. You should get a Medal of Freedom. You got to get that gold medal. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't think about things like that. I just, um, I, I do what I do because I believe in it. I do because I'm passionate about it. I love what I do. So I don't, I think like most military people, um, the ribbons and the medals that we get are just a byproduct of doing the things that we love and that we are honored to be able to do and serve and the privilege to be able to do that for the military and for the people, you know, for America. No, and you have served the country, and I, and I, everyone out there appreciates you. Who's well aware of what you've done? Uh, I, I do want to talk about the the process in getting into the YouTube's because you had to sit in a room with the suit on, and then you fell asleep in it. <laughs> I did. So yeah, the YouTube interview is a two week interview process. Typically, the YouTube program, like some of the other Air Force programs, so I switched over from the Navy to the Air Force. They require you to have previous flight experience. Um, quite extensive flight experiences in other aircraft. So I was coming off in a, of an instructor job, uh, being an instructor in the T-6. So I got picked up for an interview for the U-2 and part of the interview process is a claustrophobia check or claustrophobic check. And they put you in the suit because the suit is very heavy. It's confining. It's a very, for some it's not, you know, some people can't roll with that. So it's very, you have this helmet on your head that's a good eight pounds. It's heavy on your shoulders. It's hard to breathe when the, the visor is open. Um, it's just very unorthodox. And some people, they want to see how you react to that. So they put me in it. Yeah, I was right at home. It was quiet. You can hear the hiss of oxygen going through. And I don't mind sitting with myself for long periods of time doing nothing. So I just got, I was like, uh, let me take a nap right now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you passed that challenge. Was that the hardest part of the test? No, the hardest part, the first week, um, they do all the measurements and stuff. And then the second week is the flight. So you have to fly three flights in the YouTube. And it's the first time you do it. And they want to see how trainable you are. So before you even get into the aircraft, they, you know, they give you um, basically a package with this is how you fly the aircraft. These are the numbers you're supposed to do. This is what the flight's going to look like. And because we've flown in other aircraft, it's it's similar. But then the day you get in there and you fly it and then an the instructor's teaching you, they, they do like the first low approach, you do a low approach. Then they do the first landing and then you start land doing landings. And it's quite... Uh, uh, it's quite entertaining, to say the least, to see a new interview pilot try to land the aircraft um, safely. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, 
So I would say that was the the most challenging part because every day you have to improve. And on the third on the third day, if you don't do well, they'll say thank you for your time, but we're we're not interested. And if you get hired on, they go, hey, we'd like to hire you. Um, you have a choice to make. So luckily enough, I I made the cut and uh, came on board. L look, it wasn't my first two flights were okay. Um, I definitely wore some tail wheels out and it wasn't the prettiest, but my last flight, it all clicked in together. So that's big time. Now, was it on the first one I heard about you, you, when, cause there's the oxygen level where everything was getting foggy and you were going up in the air. Was that the first, was that the first ride? The first test? Ride? No, that was the first high flight that I ever did. So once I got into the program, I soloed and then they, the first solo you do is just in the pattern. So you learn how to do landings, all different types of landings and simulated emergencies. After that, you do your first high flight. So the first high flight is just exciting. You're excited to be in it. And um, typically most students, because they're excited, they just breathe heavily. But when you breathe like that, you we uh, provide oxygen in this aircraft by using uh, locks, liquid oxygen tanks. So you start breathing down that oxygen. And we're on the ground, not even taxiing, and my you know, caution lights are going off because I'm consuming too much oxygen because I'm just so stoked about it. And then once you get up to altitude, all the um, moisture that you've been, you know, just breathing out, it just, it fogs up your whole cockpit. <laughs> and the whole canopy gets fogged up. So you just gotta, you know, turn on the defog and just kind of just take a deep breath once you get up there because there's a lot of, you know, you're flying the aircraft up at altitude and the instructor's talking to you and you're looking and you're you're making sure everything's okay. And then uh, then you try, like when you're above 70 and then you get a moment to take a deep breath and enjoy the view. <laughs> 70,000 feet. That's that's way up there because when I think about, because you're, you're a big Twilight Zone fan, so when I think of the episode Nightmare at 30,000 feet with the gremlin... <laughs> <laughs> William Shatner, William Shatner, William Shatner, Shatner right? yeah, Captain, Captain Kirk, <laughs> one of the best episodes. Um, yeah, I don't think about Gremlins on there, but you know, there's just times, um, especially at night, you have that episode's funny at thirty thousand feet. You can see the wings, but in the U two, the wingspan is uh, one hundred and four feet, so it's it's like twice the span, at least twice the span as a normal airliner. Sometimes you'll have turbulence up there and you'll see these you'll see these wings flex and um, your eyes get really wide because it's uncomfortable because it looks like they're going to snap off. And it's uh, it, wow. yeah, it's, it's quite a ride. It's yeah. not for everyone. No, it, it's not. And unfortunately, I did read that there's a, it's a 50 50 chance of survival. I've heard I read that online. So if there's um, an ejection in the suit at altitude. Uh, typically, your odds are about 50% to, to survive the ejection. And unfortunately, that's happened to uh, a handful of, of folks that have, uh, uh, yeah, that have been on the wrong side of that 50%. So, um, yes, it's, it's it's dangerous. So at the end of the day, the ejection seat we use is called, it's a Martin Baker, I believe, uh, zero, zero ejection seat, which means zero altitude, zero uh, airspeed, you can eject on the ground and be safe for the most part. But when you eject out of the aircraft, because depending on the aircraft configuration, what it's doing and the long wingspan, you may get hit by the aircraft on the way out. So you don't want to do that. So yeah, that's, that's just not happening. good. Yeah. No, it's not good. No. And, and I heard that you were able to kind of see the process, especially with experienced pilots. When DreamWorks came in, they had the graphics on the screen. Yes. So there was, yes, when DreamWorks, so in 2014, DreamWorks came out to film the last portion of Bridge of Spies, which is, um, you know, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. Yeah, Spielberg with Tom Hanks. So we were, they really relied on our base and the, and the team of people to kind of look through the um, sequence of the ejection sequence on that which was all uh, computer animated for the most part. There were some parts that, you know, they had the actor playing, but we had some of our older uh, U2 guys. So for example, my my pilot number is 788. So when you see me on Instagram, I'm Dragon Lady 788. We had another pilot person, you know, his number is like 354. 
So that's how old he is in the program. So he's the 354th pilot. And oh. so he was there because that was, you know, the A model aircraft or C model. So he was familiar with some of those things and he could tell you more about it and give you more of a realistic perspective of what was going on. So it was kind of fun to do and it was kind of interesting to watch it as they were like, well, we're going to do this or do that. And then it was great to see DreamWorks out there doing the final scenes before they wrapped up for the show. Yep. I've heard about your experiences with Spielberg, especially you being in the cart with them and telling them you, you can't, you can't leave. <laughs> you wanted to go across the runway and you tell them you can't. <laughs> yeah. He want, he just wanted to leave the taxiway. He was focused on his next, the next scene. I was just focused on safety and the fact that we didn't want to have an incident where security forces would come and snatch Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was he was a good sport about it um he, he's a very gracious man so it was, it's he he loves military folks so it, i was it was an honor to see him in action for two days with uh dreamworks it, it, one of the old it, it's something that you really were able to tap into his genius was when he was standing there in a certain shot he wanted to get the vibration it makes sure to get that experience in there so that people in the theater would feel like they're a part of the mission. Absolutely. When he takes shots from different angles, like he wants to put that person in the aircraft and to feel every, every part of it. So that was just very interesting. And a little side note, he actually, he actually brought his dad out to Beale air force base during that time he was out there and his dad. And I don't want to butcher this, but I think he was a, uh, B-24 radio man. Um, and, you know, his dad was in his late 90s. And it was just really interesting talking to his his father. Like, it was it was an honor, and it was just great to see that. So, you know, there's, there's a man from, you know, World War II who had done all these great things, and he's talking about it, and he's at Beale Air Force Base, and he sees all these aircraft. And you could just see him light up. He's just, he was enjoying it. So it was nice. It was nice to, uh, I don't know, just have that moment. Yeah. <laughs> Guys gave him a cake for his birthday too. Um, we we did <laughs> we uh did the traditional um military sheet cake for all those who don't know. We just do sheet cake with some icing and we did that for uh I think I don't know his birthday sometime in December. So I think it's like December sixth or something. So it was kind of fun. It was the it was the day of wrap up was the day of his birthday. So Yeah, no, it, it was great hearing about that. That whole experience. I'm surprised. Did he invite you out to the premiere? Did he did he give you any invites out there? So um out at the base, he did um there was they had a private screening for us. Okay, good. For the base. So there were certain people who were able to do it. So it was uh it was pretty cool. Um we were able to go and watch the movie and then see the end credits and see Beale being recognized. Pretty that yeah, was pretty dope. It was nice yes. to see my name up there. That, that, that's nice. That, that's amazing. He, he really is down to earth and one of the all-time greats for sure. Absolutely. I, I did want to get into this because it's so interesting when you look at it because I'm someone that has a fear of flights. How do you break that out of someone when there's someone that wants to get into your position and, and fly missions and, and do things with you, not even just U2s, but jets? How do you break them out of the fear of flights? Wow. So, I mean, for people who want to do it but are afraid, you know, you have to go up and experience it. You have to, I would say for your first time going in a commercial airliner, don't go into like a Cessna 172 because it's very small. And on a hot day, it's very bouncy. It doesn't feel that great. So your experiences might not be, you might get nauseous. But if you want to start in the sim, go in the simulator, go in a, if you, you know, a realistic simulator that's like 360 degrees if you can. Uh, do some VR work to see what that feels like. I mean, you know, now virtual reality, if you've got some Oculus or something, is highly realistic. Um, you know, I have, yeah, I have an Oculus and there are some games I play, I got to take it off because I start, you know. Realistic. Years, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty real, pretty, pretty realistic. Um, I would start with that and kind of get acclimated and then go with a friend that you trust in an aircraft and just go for a ride. Um, you know, a lot of people, I didn't know how I was going to do the first time I got in an aircraft, like to fly it. And it was different flying in the Cessna 152 where it was bumpy and I didn't feel that great as opposed to me flying a military trainer 
in the front cockpit. It was a totally different experience. Um, it was it was like night and day. I felt really good in this aircraft. So um, go with someone you trust. Try the VR stuff first, and then kind of walk yourself in. It'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no it's it's scary for certain people but you could always break out of that fear you've said it before anything as long as you put the hard work in you can make whatever it is that you want to make it yourself you can and sometimes you know part of that the thrill of it for some people even just sitting in the cockpit of an aircraft and just taxiing around on the runway and not take off that might be a huge like over, you know, overcome for them. And that's, you got to celebrate that and celebrate those small things. So, you know, maybe the next time you're taxiing around and the next time someone takes off real quick, does one turn and come back, you might be screaming the entire time, but you'll do it and you'll be like, I wasn't so bad. And then you keep taking a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear about this frightening experience because I did hear that it was this helicopter that it, you almost hit the ground into the water it was a mission late at night i heard you were trying to track a submarine and that was that was pretty scary um yeah it was probably um for me um a defining moment in terms of how i conduct myself as a pilot as air crew as anything and uh you know it was when i in the navy my first fleet aircraft was helicopters so i flew helicopters um sh-60 bravo seahawks for those out there who are military like military aircraft um so the 60 bravos and my first first training mission after i had become qualified in the aircraft was with a aircraft commander who was um it just wasn't the best you know you know you have some doctors that graduate with an a and some doctors that graduate with a d he's probably a pilot that graduated with a c minus so um we were flying one night um, out doing a training mission looking for a submarine and there were some we had to actually id it by throwing a chem light or something on it and we knew where it was but it was too dark it was foggy and we decided to we can only go to a certain altitude but we decided to go down and all of us in the aircraft myself the aircraft commander as well as the air crew member decided to do what we call a coupled hover and it's a um, automated hover down to 50 feet because our operating procedures said you couldn't go below 200 feet at night, but it didn't talk about doing it in a coupled uh, hover. So we started to do that. I was slow taking out the checklist. Little did I know that the aircraft commander without saying anything started a manual descent. And then something didn't feel right because my head was down and I, and I felt this bump and I looked up and we were descending through 20 feet. And uh, I yelled power. The air crew member couldn't see anything because his head was outside the helicopter. He was looking outside the doors, trying to find the sub. And we probably hit, we ended around six feet and we started climbing back up. So that just taught me a lot. Number one, um, you know, play stupid games. You're gonna win stupid prizes, right? So yeah. there's operating procedures for a reason and you know, trying to bypass on the training mission. What what good is that? And you know, the person you're flying with, you have to have good crew coordination. You can't do that. And I need to keep an eye on people. Don't trust just because they have more experience than me that they're better or they can't, they're not, they can't make mistakes. So no, is. yeah, that's that's crazy. And that was all with the the coupled approach. Yes. So again, he manually started descending. He was going to put it into a couple approach. I guess that was his mindset, but he just, he flew below 200 feet manually, which you shouldn't do. And as we're, you know, as we're doing that, you know, he just got a little disoriented. It happens. Unfortunately, that could have put us in the, in the water for no reason. And yeah. we just had a mishap like two months prior with this, with a different crew and a different squadron that did exactly the same thing. <laughs> Hopefully so, they got some trainers in there to fix all these issues. <laughs> well, there's, there was no issue. It's just like, Hey guys, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Unbelievable. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I, I want to dip more into the positive because it, not only when passing the first ride with the U2, it, which you that, that's the major achievement, but what is your defining moment besides that? Because the defining moment you just mentioned, you know, the, the first test that you passed, but we, we got into the negative one. But what's another one that really lingers out there? Defining moments for me. So I get this a lot, but I'm going to I'm going to be more, I think, holistic about this answer. So it, it's funny, my military career, uh, over 23 years in the military. So when I retired in 2017, half my life was the military, right? So that's all I, you know, read, eat, sleep is military. And in these last, what, six years, you know, a lot of things have happened. So, you know, I was a mom when I was in the military, but my, my uh, kids have grown. You know, during my time at shortly after retirement, we brought another kid into our family. Um, we adopted another, you know, we adopted a child. And so I think my defining moment is that I'm not, um, I'm the sum of all these awesome parts. So my Navy, my Navy background, my Air Force background, the fact that um, when I was in the military, I had a, a kid while I was doing a staff tour and I had to make that decision, whether it was the military or family life, to choose raising my son in a way that my, I bet you if my mom was alive today, said she wishes she could raise me in that format. So, or raise me and not have this, like I have to work and sustain for the family. So I could be there for my son in a way and now bring another child in to a situation that, and we're not perfect, but, you know, we're a positive influence, my husband and I. And so I think for me, the moment of being able to do all these things in a lifetime, I'm just, I feel really blessed and fortunate to be able to do and to be disciplined enough to make it all work despite the chaos that ensues sometime. And so for me, that is important. And in between all that, do a reality show and still do that and come out with a book, come out with an audio book. So the second half of life outside of the military as I do more and more, my military stuff becomes just a little smaller, but it's still a big part of me. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see what else I do in the future. And um, so that that is my defining moment, to not be defined by any one thing, not to, as they say, peak in high school. I'm yeah. not peaking. Like, I just continue. Like, one hill, come here. All right, let's go. Let's climb the next hill. And I think, I wish sometimes more people would think like that. Like when one part of your world closes, oh, there's so much more. It's like space, explore it, take on the challenges. Let's, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when we look at the entire history here and just everything that's, that's going on in this country, when I look back at movies such as Men of Honor and, and just seeing that the struggles that African-Americans go through, especially when you've seen in movies, how it's been depicted in the military, how was your experience as far as the racism? Did, were there people, trainers there that cracked down once they would see issues like that, that would occur? What were some of the experiences that uh, you may have seen or even gone through yourself that you feel comfortable about uh, speaking? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I'll put this in perspective. I started in the military in the nineties. So mid nineties, 94, and in the beginning, there was a push in the Navy and I think other branches of service, other branches of service for um, minorities, especially in the engineering STEM fields, to come into the pilot program. And I and I understand, you know, now why because it takes a long time to groom someone from an ensign all the way to a captain or admiral, just the same way as in the military, second lieutenant, all the way to general or um, colonel. And so I think when we first started, there were quite a few of us. We all didn't make it. Um, I could tell you in a group of five women of color, I was the only one to finish flight training. They all left for certain reasons, academically or medically or, or whatever. And I would say the pilots, military pilots, the active duty were great. The reservists were great. Some of the simulator instructors who were older back in you know, the Vietnam era or, um, you know, some of, uh, you know, World War II guys, you know, that they were like, they had that mentality. You could tell not my service. They made things a little harder, but it's something that's just an obstacle that you have to overcome. I think my first ex 
when I started to doubt myself, my first flight instructor just told me, hey, Meryl, when you walk into a room, a, a lot of people are going to think things when you walk in. They're going to think you're here because of X, Y, and Z. And he's like, if you keep performing as you performed when you were my student, you were one of the best students I've, flo I've flown with, um, eventually they're going to have to say you're here because you're that damn good. So, you know, performance is usually the thing that trumps everything. And if people don't want you there because of your gender, because you're different, eventually they're just going to be talking behind you because you're just going to be going beyond them. You got to stay focused. Um, you got to keep performing. And yeah, there is a pressure to perform. I mean, for, you know, when you're the only person sitting at a table and no one else looks like you, there is pressure to perform. I put pressure on myself. Everything that I say at the end of it, at the end of the conversation, at the end of the meeting, I scrutinize to make sure I did not embarrass myself, embarrass my organization, embarrass those who are behind me that are trying to come up. Because I know people are going to put that in the back, back of their head. So I think throughout time in the military, there are a lot of people that believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I met that with, you know, I had to be reminded of that when I was about to leave. And I had a general who said, no, we need to have you stay longer. And he went to bat for me, not even knowing. He saw my record. He didn't know who I was. But he said, we need to have you here. Because he knew that my being in the military longer was incredibly important for those coming up behind me. And so, yeah, so, I mean, over time, it's it's gotten better. But it just depends. It depends on the organization. And I think people of color will always you know, there's not many of us in the military, especially as you get at the higher echelons. And so we always have to represent. We always have to be on point. There's always going to be that pressure. But we're up to the challenge. And I'm sure one day it'll be more more of us. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm sure it will. It's, it's got to progress here. It 100%ly has to. And it's important. Thank you for sharing all, all the the information that you experienced and just seeing how things should change and, you know, on your way out, especially now that you're retired, AI is a big topic. Now it's going to be taking over everything. You're seeing it everywhere. It's copying me <laughs> musicians and all this stuff. It's going crazy. I I'm still big into, you need humans to be flying these aircrafts. What do you see as far as AI now with, do you think it's going to be, ha have a big impact here on the, U not even just U2s, but all aircraft? I think um, AI is interesting. Yes, it's going to change a lot of things. Um, I think people who work with their hands in construction in the trades, I think we're still going to need a lot of people that do that. Um, you know, just being on tough as nails, that stuff's hard to make it automated, to make it, it's going to be hard for AI. I'm saying it's impossible, but it's hard. For aircraft, um, we have drones, you know, the U-2, we flew um, with the Global Hawk aircraft, which was an unmanned aircraft. Um, but again, how many people does it take to fly an unmanned aircraft? Um, it takes quite a few, by the way. Um, you know, you still have your sensor operators, your other people who are watching the aircraft and still navigating it. So for AI, I think AI will help the process, but I don't think you want to take a human out of the loop of everything because you never know some unintended consequences. I think people as a whole will always feel uncomfortable if there is not a pilot in the front seat of an aircraft flying because they have no skin in the game <laughs> if something were to occur. So um, for transporting, um, you know, mail equipment and all that stuff, great. But maybe for people, people want to see other people. Um, so. I think it will change and I think it will, I think if we were smart, we would change it slowly over time. And in terms of AI being used to deploy as, you know, for defense or warp tree, it's, you know, it's, it's coming. We just have to be ready and we have to be able to, um, you know, just ret maintain control of it and really insert a person in the loop. I think that would help out. It may reduce the manpower, but we'll always, I believe we'll, I think we should have someone there. So, yeah, 
I'm not sure. I'm not in the military anymore. I'm not sure what they're thinking. <laughs> I would just say um, to hedge your bets, make sure there's some human monitoring. <laughs> what what film that you've seen as far as w- with missions that go that has happened in, in, in history of film that's most realistic to what you've done? Because when we look at because I know people that have seen war movies say that Stephen Private Ryan is the most realistic war movie ever made. What's the most uh-huh. realistic when it comes to the space and flying missions? Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> the space of flying missions. That's a good question. I got to think about that. Um, the only one that's coming to mind right now that I think people really love was Top Gun Maverick. Okay. Um, yeah, to my Air Force brethren, I'm sorry. We we make some horrible movies. Iron <laughs> Eagle is not our best performance. <laughs> um, the Navy really rocks with that. And um, I, I like Top Gun Maverick. Okay, the scenario was kind of hokey. You had to press the I believe button. But everything in terms of like the G-forces, what it does on the body, all that stuff. I think it was very realistic. It was like, yeah, that's plausible. But the fact that, you know, he landed in Russian territory and and then there was like an F-14 just, you know, you had to press that. Like that was entertainment, but the physiological aspects of the aircraft and some of the things it could do. Um, I went with a whole bunch of other Navy pilots that day and some of them were uh, Tomcat drivers. Pretty realistic. It was It was enjoyable. I'm sorry, Iron Eagle was, I don't even remember. I just remember it being not good. Air Force, <laughs> Air Force, you didn't come with a stronger story. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, who knows when that's going to be. So the, the the people that are home right now, up and coming filmmakers, now's your time because the whole writer's industry is on strike. The actor's industry is on strike. So if you're at home and you want to break through in this industry, now's your time because it, it, you see the changes that are happening right now with all the strikes. It, it's insane. Yeah. I mean, I, and I understand, I mean, I know some friends who are writers and uh, they were getting short end of the stick. So, yeah, you know, it's anything I've learned um, when I did tough as nails and I watched people who work with their hands and doing houses and buildings, you pay people what they're worth. Like you pay, you pay for the creativity, you pay for, um, building a home, you pay for laying the foundation. Like, like, stop trying to get over on people like that who are just trying to make hard, just trying to live in their overexpensive rent place. Like, seriously, like, try to do that stuff by yourself. Yeah. It's tough. <laughs> <laughs> Whether, I mean, I'm just being real. Like, man, when's the last time someone tried to roll carpet in their house or tile? That stuff is difficult, and you're sore. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, you want to write this, this great story and you want someone to sit down for hours on end to create something that's beautiful and you don't want to provide and you're like, ah, oh, AI can do that. Maybe, maybe they could do something that's interesting, but I think as human beings, our minds are just beautiful and the things that we create and having AI maybe help augment that and bounce stuff off. I mean, it's a beautiful thing, but people should be paid for the time that they invest. And yeah. it's only fair. Oh, I agree. Writers, yeah. they're the vision for everything. They're the, they're the, they bring everything alive. And it's, it's, it's insane what we're going through. And then the, there's a ton of strikes. I heard UPS is going to be going on a strike soon. So yeah, we're going through a shift right now. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, case in point for my book, Shattered Sky, I had a, I had a ghostwriter and his name is Lance Thompson, and he is a friend. He's been a friend of mine for over 10 years. He writes military history. He is he is great in his thinking. He says something. He's the guy who, I think it was the movie Predator 2. He did the marketing for that. Okay, so with Danny right. Glover, Bill Paxson. Yeah, he, he did the marketing. Like, that was him. That was, like, his wow. brainchild. That's how smart he is. How would that come across? Like, hey, I want you to help write a book and not pay you what <laughs> <laughs> it makes it, it makes no sense anyway so um yeah pay people for what they're worth people are worth a lot we have a lot of value and uh yeah pay those who are creating yeah oh i agree and you bring up your book you have it in the background shatter the sky right there your, your biography right there yes yeah shatter 2021 sky. it was october it was released Yes, October of 2021. Um, it, 
this was uh this was a interesting day so not to bring it down it was released the same day my mom passed away oh my condolences so, so yeah thank you but you know it was just it was just a very defining day so um yeah i'm proud that i'm able to share my story and inspire some people i've gotten a lot of feedback this year i came out with the audiobook which um uh has done really well you know again shout out to my friend lance and phil kogan um who's the host for uh the amazing race who's the executive producer for tough as nails he did the forward yeah so he did he did the forward for the book and um you know i'm just really pleased and i'm i'm glad that after you know a couple of years out of retirement that all these things have happened that i was able to you know talk about it and inspire folks i'm still getting a lot of feedback off the book so if you haven't gotten it, it's it's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, in a way, you have a response to the t- notorious B.I.G. song, Sky's the Limit. You said, no, the sky is not the limit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, sky is not the limit. So uh, when we were coming up with this, a lot of, you know, during the time that I was thinking about developing this, a lot of uh, the saying was like shattering glass ceilings and breaking glass ceilings. I'm like, man. I look up and I'm like, my ceiling's pretty low. That's a low bar, man. We gotta, we gotta aim much higher, so much higher. So, yeah, and, that's and, what I want and, people to do. And you did. Is there gonna be a movie? I really think there should be a movie on your life story. Any talks about a documentary or movie in the works at all that you could speak about? Um, nothing, nothing I could speak about. I will just say that, uh, yeah, there's some things that in works. So if anyone's listening right now and they know some writers and producers after the strike is over, because we wouldn't do anything during that time, we we'll definitely respect that. Um, yeah. Hit me up on Instagram, Dragon Lee 788 Let's go, Spike. Let's go. Spike let's, Lee, right? Let's get let's, let's go. <laughs> uh let's get to it. I did want to talk about this because you you were in mixed martial arts training and you're also a personal trainer too. You you train from the ages of seven to seventy nine. I do. So um, when I left the military, most people were surprised. Hey, come to the airlines. I didn't want to do that. Um, I've always wanted to fly. I, I like to do missions, but I don't like to do like transport and cargo. That's that's not my that's not my scene. Um, so I decided to become a personal trainer. It was a way, an avenue for me to motivate people I, and um, inspire people like through fitness. It's huge. So to motivate people to be better versions of, of themselves through fitness is great. And uh, yeah, I have a martial arts background. I've been doing martial arts since I was 19. Um, everything from Jeet Kune Do to Muay Thai to boxing and uh, to Wing Chun. And I use that as part of it. So do boxing routines, but you know, I've changed some people in a good way. Like my one of my first long-term clients, he was 12, 13 at the time, uh, doing a lot of therapy, homeschool, had depression. We worked out probably for about two years. Uh, this young man, who's a young man now, um, lost probably about 30 pounds, really not seeing a therapist because, you know, exercise for mental health, huge. It is, I know people are depressed and I don't, I would never assume anything that anyone's going through, but if you can somehow incorporate exercise as part of your recovery, getting back on track, it it does wonders. And so this, this kid went from doing all that to going to school in person to doing a whole bunch of things and just changing, you know, other than the fact, you know, he's becoming a teenager, but he was just changing for the better. So um, I love seeing that. And I have trained younger kids. I've trained older people. One of my long-term clients, he'll be 80 this year. He's a lawyer. He's feisty. He gets mad when he misses a week with me. He's a fellow pilot. So we have a lot in common. So uh, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it quite a bit. Yeah, and the first thing I know you always approach that your the people that you work with that you train is basically changing their diet. Are you getting enough fiber? You're basically asking them what they consume. Yeah, it's you know, it's just really I think it's just basic questions when they say, Hey, I want to get on a I I want to get on a 
diet plan. I go, number one, I don't really do diets because diets tell me you just are short term. So let's talk about how we're going to change habits forever. So if you're drinking, I have one client who's drinking, you know, half a liter of Dr. Pepper a day. And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> like, Why? And I'm like, let's look at the nutrition chart. Let's look at how much sugar. And I said, we need to drink more water. And I said, you're going to be cranky for the next couple of weeks, but you need to persevere through that. And I watched her in about eh, two months, three months, lose 20, 20, 25 pounds, just cutting out certain things or just substituting. Um, people want to go paleo. People want to go vegan. People want to do all these things for diet purposes. I'm just like, how about cut out processed foods? If yeah. you eat him, if you eat him McDonald's twice a week, how about we just cut that out? Let's start with that. Yeah. And drink water. And they're like, what? And I'm like, just <laughs> cut that out. You want some French fries? I want you to get a potato peeler. I want you to peel your French fries. I want you to cut them. And I want you to put them in. Well, that's a lot of work. Yes, it is. Is it really that important to you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's like, hey, let's cut out if if most of us dial back on the processed foods and just ate more of us preparing and pre-planning and thinking ahead and being disciplined about that you would see an automatic change drink more water of course exercise and there's a huge there's going to be a huge shift yeah. so stop thinking in diets stop thinking in terms of diets start thinking in terms of the long-term changes forever. Yeah, no, you you gotta have some sort of discipline there. Change up everything. Diets are right; they're only short-term. You want to change your life because that's yes. that's what's gonna keep yeah, you healthy. Some people, yeah, and some people think it's very daunting to change everything. I'm just saying. I always tell people, hey, let's just change one one thing. Can we just keep that? Because just one, and then once we got that under control, okay, let's change the next thing. But people want their life plan like they want their food processed and quick so you can't like you know that triangle you can have it you could have it cheap but not good but you could have it quick and you know there's that triangle you can those certain things apply to your life as well you want a good life it takes time no it does and and just that that's important right there it could really change people's lives but as far as because i did hear about with you adopting your kids Foster, you want to give people opportunities. That was something that you were strict on. Um, absolutely. Um, when we, you know, 2020, I believe it was, we received a foster child in our house. And a lot of people say, hey, why did you want to do that? And I, and I said, you know, they're like, you have a biological child already. And I said, well, you know, we've been blessed. We've made some great choices. We want to give someone an opportunity who's been dealt a terrible hand, the opportunity to be the best version of themselves. I'm not saying they're going to be, they got a lot of things to overcome. Um, our daughter has, you know, as any child of trauma, whether they're biological or not, there's just things that makes you who you are. You got things to overcome. And so, we're going to help her through that and we're helping her through that. So, you know, at the end of the day, when she leaves the house or goes to college or goes to vet school or whatever she wants to do, she can go, well, you guys were pretty hard, but I guess this is okay. Well, yeah, because you're, you're adulting, unlike some people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that, that's amazing. And just God bless you and, and everything that you do and you have done. What's something that you're looking to achieve for this year at the at the end of this year? Do you have some goals that you're looking to? What's on the docket for the rest of 2023? Yeah, so the rest of 2023 is to to um, be interviewed by awesome people such as yourself. Oh, um, I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. This is great. Um, great conversation. Um, probably continue to tell my story. Uh, get on different um, venues, maybe on different talk shows. And uh, just spread that word. I think we need more positivity out there. There's a lot of, um, you know, negative self-talk, just the media in general. And we just need a lot of, we just need a lot of good stories. And really to finish off this summer, get my kids back into school because um, I'm tired of being an Uber service for them. 
and taking him to all these activities. My fault. I planned it. I know, but I'm. It's it's get to the end of summer and it's time for them to go back to school. And... <laughs> time to start charging. <laughs> it's, it is. Oh man, they are. Nothing pleases them, man. <laughs> my, my daughter, I'm like, uh, yeah, she's part of the family now. <laughs> Oh boy. I, I did want to ask you this because this ties back into my show and you're from the Bronx. That's where hip hop originated. Do you remember some of these parties that were going on there with Grandmaster Flash and Kaz? Do you remember anything with hip hop being around there? You know, I just, I just remember the music and just how cool it was. When you lived during that time, I, I don't think, I don't think I, I realized the gravity of like hip hop was created there. And you know, we just enjoyed the moment. So I have a uh, my friend um, Cormega. Um, he's from okay, Queens. from Queensbridge. Yeah, he's been on the show. He, has he? Yeah. Well, he. So I went to see him last week down in L.A. Um, perform, and you know, we graduated from the same high school. Oh wow! So, so, um, so it was great to see him. I hung out with him for a while you know, got to talk to him and just watch him in his environment. And if you ever go on to his social media, um, Cormega on Instagram, he's doing this whole 50 year of hip hop and just writing about everyone. I mean, it's just amazing. The information that this man has. And every time I read one of his posts, I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. So like for me, a kid in the Bronx, I just lived the moment. Like I was, I loved it. I loved the music. I loved everything about it. It made me feel great. It made me feel special. It got me through a lot of hard times. So, yeah, I mean, Grandmaster Flash and all these. I wasn't at those parties and stuff. Yeah. I wasn't cool like that. Um, but just hearing the music and everything, it just it brings me back to those days. Yes, yeah. I love it. Hey, yeah. Do you have a favorite? A favorite artist of all time? Favorite artist of all yeah, time. in the, in the hip hop genre. I mean, starting out, like, I love Curtis Blow. Curtis Blow, um, the breaks. The breaks. Um, man, you know, of course, you know, I like Nas. I like, oh, yeah. I like, you know, Biggie, of course. I yeah. mean, I just, I don't have a top five list. It'll change from, <laughs> it'll change from moment to moment. It, it just will. I mean, Cormega, you listen to him, The Realness, The Realness too. Realness is a classic, yeah. Yeah, listen to Realness last Saturday. Like, I could have stayed up in another place. I went right in the center and just, just watched and felt how he moved the crowd. Like, The Realness is good, just good stuff, just real stuff. Um, yeah, there's too many. Yeah. There's too many. All were good. Queen Latifah. Yeah, female rappers, UNITY, and all that. Yeah. Oh yes, I mean, um, man, going to Truman High School, there were some. I remember when Inspector Gadget, like that mix, was going around all the time, and that was good. I, yeah, there's too many. <laughs> like it's bringing me back. Sorry, we could we can have a whole hip hop uh, conversation <laughs> going down memory lane. Oh, uh, like Nas and memory lane sitting in the park. But we we need this whole documentary on the way. Like I said, I called out Spike Lee earlier. How about Spielberg? Let's get him involved. All these big time directors to, to get oh, a movie yeah. on your life story. Jordan B. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's got to happen here. Meryl, thank you for coming on the show. It, it was an honor. Thank you to Yvonne. And everyone out there, Caitlin, for setting this up. Make sure they let them know where they can follow you on Instagram, Twitter. And, and you also have your own website, too. I do. I have it. It's MerylTengestall.com. Oh. Sorry, can you still hear me? Uh, I only heard you right after I asked you what everything was. And uh, yeah. you, can follow, you can follow me on MerylTengestall.com. You can call Yvonne, uh, La Bella Diva, uh, PR. You can also find me on Instagram, DragonLee788. That is my home. Um, if you're a professional, you want to go on LinkedIn and find me. Um, or Facebook. I'm really slow on Facebook because it's seriously old. And then you can find me on threads as well. So Meryl Tengestall, look me up. 
um, Google me or Bing me, it's uh, I'll pop up with a whole bunch of stuff. There's no reason why you should not be able to get in touch with me. Yeah, no, there's no excuses, no reason. You have it right there. Meryl, thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome anytime. Salute oh, to you and you everything that you've done and making history. It's big time. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, anytime. Take care, stay safe. And I look forward to seeing the upcoming movie and everything you have on the way. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Get that audio book. Yes, I absolutely will. Everyone out there, get it as well. All right. All right, bye-bye.